Welcome to the Adventurous Minds Podcast, examining fitness and wellness through the lens of outdoor sport and adventure. Welcome back to another episode of Adventurous Minds. It's your host, Timmy Summers, and our next guest is Tyler Brott, an all-around adventure athlete, but he is most known for his whitewater kayaking career. In his trusty boat, Tyler has charged some of the wildest whitewater, explored new rivers, and broken the world record for the highest waterfall descent twice. On top of that, Tyler has traveled the globe by land, air, and sea, and has enough stories to fill multiple books. He is an absolute joy to chat with, and his energy and stories will inspire you to get out there and get busy living. Well, thanks for coming on here. This is uh, it's pretty exciting for me because when I was in um, like early early high school, I was, I don't know, 12, 13, 14, kind of that age range. I was just starting to kind of get into whitewater and you were kind of getting up some pretty cool expeditions and adventures. Like during that time for me, that was like when wizard's eye was coming out, it's when Palouse was. Um, and so I've been following you for a really long time. So it's, it's pretty cool for me to get to chat with you. So thank you for coming on. Yeah, Timmy, I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Yeah. So I thought a good place to start would, why don't you just like take us back to when you were a kid, you know, when did you first get into kayaking and kind of just contextualize everything for us? Yeah. So it's hard to, it's hard to remember a time that I wasn't kayaking. I, uh, I grew up in Montana, Western Montana, Bitterroot Valley, um, really, really beautiful place. And, you know, I really owe it, um, all to my father. He, um, you know, I grew up, you know, hiking, fishing, um, you know, just spending time in the outdoors, hunting with my dad. And he sort of discovered, um, you know, kayaking and life on the river a little bit later in life. He was maybe 47, 48 when he, you know, started, you know, felt, you know, started hanging out with a group of friends that were paddling and running rivers. He like, you know, this is like before river gear was really good. This was, um, you know, dad was born in um, like 1942 or something. So, you know, he was, you know, this is, I was born in 86. And so, you know, we're talking about, you know, like we're talking about like early eighties here. And so this is, you know, like kayaks are these like long fiberglass things. There's like really not amazing gear. Um, He went down to Kmart, bought a raft, um, you know, painted it gray. So it looked like the other rafts, like started, you know, going on the river, um, taking my two older brothers on the river. There's lots of family um, adventure stories or misadventure stories of like wearing wool sweaters and garbage bags and some life jackets and being and, like pouring rainstorms on like flooded springtime Montana rivers. We don't need to go into that, but um, eventually <laughs> dad decided that, uh, you know, he was watching the kayakers. He was like, oh man, the kayakers are the ones that are actually out there, you know, having fun and surfing waves. And so he decided to start kayaking. And so he got into kayaking, sort of taught himself how to kayak, how to roll. And then, uh, he, and then, you know, I came along. I was about, you know, six years old by the time that dad, you know, really fell in love with kayaking. And so he got my, um, my closest brother in age to me, Jody, he got us both kayaks, um, taught us both how to kayak. I was six years old. My brother's six years older than me. So he was about 12. And at that point I was just, you know, I fell in love with it. I really enjoyed it. It was a great time, you know, a great um, opportunity to be just like out there with my dad on the water. And it was adventurous. Um, it was really scary for me. I didn't know how to roll, you know, dad had glued together like this neoprene vest for me. And I had this makeshift gear and I had like, uh, uh, this helmet that dad had like screwed horns on to. So it like looked, you know, cooler. And anyway, it was, it was, it was quite a seed. Um, and, and yeah, but I, you know, I just started, you know, started getting into it, learning, um, you know, eventually got big enough to where I could actually roll the kayak when I was about 10 years old. And then, you know, starting, you know, 12, 13, um, started getting really good at kayaking and, all that I could dream about is, you know, was being a uh, professional kayaker. So it was like focused tunnel vision. Um, definitely, you know, I was sort of like my, my parents separated when I was young. And so, you know, I was, you know, living on the ranch with my mom. My dad was, you know, close by, but he was, you know, into like, you know, the outdoors and adventures. And so on the weekends, I'd be with my dad 
going out having fun. And during the week, I'd be with mom on the ranch, you know, fixing fence mm-hmm. and changing pipes and, you know, doing, doing the whole thing. And, you know, eventually I was just like, I think, you know, I think this kayaking thing is a lot more fun than rafting. I'm going to, I'm going to go that direction. <laughs> that, that makes that, that checks out. <laughs> so did you, did you compete or were you kind of just always on like the adventure side of it when you were in, uh, when you were a kid? Yeah, I, I competed. Um, there was like freestyle competition was the thing back then. We uh, had these short boats. It was all about surfing waves or holes, doing tricks. Uh, there was judges that would then score the rides. And my first competition, uh, I was 12 years old. I was competing in a junior class. And I won that competition. And and at that point, you know, I was like out on like, you know, like these um like these chat forums, like whatever they're called, like for, for us in kayaking, it's like boater talk. I'm sure every sport has their, you know, old school, yeah. like form there used to be. And I was like 12 years old. I just won my first competition. Like, how do I get sponsored? You know, <laughs> like that was like my main question. And, and so, yeah. And so competition was a big part of my life for a little bit. And, uh, but then I eventually just um, sort of, gradually transitioned towards the, like the more extreme side of kayaking waterfalls expeditions um you know steep class five rivers and that's where i um yeah and that's where i really really found my passion in kayaking yeah and when you kind of made that transition was that something you know when you turned 18 and you're like done with school like, all right, I'm just going to go travel and figure this out and be a pro kayaker, if that was even a thing at the time. Or is it, you know, were you a guide? Like, how did you kind of transition into that world? So when I was 14 years old, I, um, and even a little bit younger, I just through the local paddling scene, I ran into who was, you know, not my first kayaking mentor, but one of my early kayaking mentors. He was going to college at the time. He was a professional kayaker working with Teton Gravity Research in a series of kayaking films that they did back in the day. And so um, I was in my first film when I was 14 years old, kayaking on the North Fork of the Payette, um, you know, and they were just, you know, stoked that this kid was out there, like having fun, paddling well. And so I, you know, I was in this film when I was 14 and I got invited to go to Norway, Norway and Iceland when I was, you know, 15 years old. And so I was out there traveling with them and you know, hadn't, you know, and, you know, filming, being in films, hadn't left the nest yet, you know, so I was like, you know, didn't really have a lot of my own expenses I was having to cover, you know, I was, um, and, you know, and so I was able to sort of, you know, start taking steps into professional kayaking before I needed to, like, worry about getting a real job, you know, per se, and so, mm-hmm. I, you know, I graduated high school. I actually graduated high school. I went to World Class Kayak Academy. It's a, a paddling um, high school for kids. I was able to get a scholarship to go there. And then I went there for two years. Um, my, let's see, my, um, my sophomore and junior year of high school, I went to World Class Academy. It's this awesome school. You go to a different country every semester. You're able to travel learn be with you know your your teachers your peers you're paddling every day taking school high school courses but when my senior year rolled around um like we we just couldn't afford it um and so you know I was basically faced with having to go back to public school which you know just sounded terrible after this experience I was just having so I um, decided to, um, enroll in correspondence courses and, uh, and try to finish high school that way. I worked for a summer up in Bozeman, Montana, laying hardwood floors, scraped enough money to, uh, go to this place that I always dreamed of the, the white Nile in Uganda, Africa. And I, you know, so I got enough ticket to, you know, to basically get myself to Africa um, enrolled in correspondence courses, went over there for my senior year of high school, was paddling every day. Um, it was amazing. I ended up, you know, running up a bar tab that was more money than I had at the time. I think I had like $300, you know, and, uh, and, and that's really when I learned how to work and make a living kayaking. I started up a kayak school. I started raft guiding. I was, uh, you know, kind of, you know, just had to take it upon myself to figure out how to, you know, not only make enough money to live, but also pay off, pay off my, this like outstanding bar debt that I had racked up over 
you know, the course of a month, it's on a tab system. So this isn't just like a big night out, you know, this is, um, you know, over like the course of a month, you know, and so, <laughs> and so it was really valuable. I, I learned how to uh, basically make my way in the world as a, as a kayaker, not even a professional kayaker at this point, just, you know, coaching, um, you know, running this kayak school. I was guiding tandem kayaks down the river. I was raft guiding and um, yeah, I lived over there for six months, finished high school and, you know, was able to get on my flight home you know, didn't have any money in my pocket, but I, you know, had successfully just, you know, lived on my own for, for, you know, for a considerable period of time, got back and just, you know, started putting together, you know, film projects, um, you know, expeditions, getting sponsorship for it and kind of just got, you know, catapulted into the, you know, the dirtbag professional, you know, lifestyle. I, I really, you know, I learned that it does, you don't have to make a lot of money, but it's, you just can't really spend that much money. You know, it's like a lot of like <laughs> right. butter sandwiches, you know, it's like, you know, you know, not, you know, not driving a whole bunch of uh, carpooling, you know, there's just, you know, it was, it was great just, you know, figuring out how to make it all work. Yeah, totally. Wow. That's, that's so interesting. That's a, that high school sounds amazing to be able to like, I mean, to be kayaking every day and that's part of your high school curriculum. I mean, that's, that's absurd. <laughs> no, it's amazing. It, it was such a, <laughs> such an amazing opportunity. I was, I was really lucky that high school actually started up right in my hometown, Missoula, Montana. So I, I knew, um, you know, the, the director of the school and it was just, you know, it's really, really fortunate, um, very serendipitous that I was able to attend that school and, and it definitely helped my kayaking hit some, hit some pretty high levels and just seeing, um, I had never had any formal coaching before. And so it was really amazing just to see the benefit in, um, you know, in training, you know, and coaching, um, cross training and, you know, and just really kind of learning how to do that from a young age, helped my athleticism quite a lot. Yeah, I bet. And I mean, the, the really interesting part to me is that you were spending, uh, every semester you were in a new country. Is that right? Yeah, every semester. So I was in New Zealand, Ecuador, Chile, and Mexico with the program over those two years. I mean, that level of like exploration at a young age, I mean, that's such a cool thing to be able to experience. Um, I mean, it's pretty hard to replicate that too. Cause like, you know, it's one thing to go just study in a different country, but it's a whole nother thing to be like in the wild, bringing kayaks around, like, you know, living that already that kind of dirtbag lifestyle that kayaking has like that's kind of it's pretty cool to be to have done that from such a young age yeah and, and you know and for me the the value of the education just in in traveling and um you know getting to meet people from you know different walks of life and just have that sort sort of a more global um experience it really showed, showed me that there's um you know there's there's many forms of uh, many ways to to become educated in this world and Obviously, there's the traditional way of, you know, going, going to school, going to college. Um, there, there's that path. And it's a great one. And, it, you know, it's, it's amazing. There is, um, you know, some, some just in, incredible um, educational institutions out there. And, you know, you can really achieve a, you know, a very high level of education. But you can also, you know, take the, the path less traveled and have, you know, just gain um, knowledge in, in more of a, a worldly way traveling. And just having more of a hands-on approach to it, and so you know, I I love learning. Um, I've spent spent my lifetime, you know, you know, learning, you know, learning sports or languages, um, you know, diff building, you know, different, just all these like you know, amazing tools that that um, are available to us to you know be able to navigate this life. And I took a non-traditional approach. I you know, I graduated high school, but then I you know, I didn't go to college. I pursued kayaking, professional kayaking, full time, and it's amazing. You know, I, I see where I am now. I'm 35 years old and I, and I look back at it and I was like, I was like, wow, you know, I didn't think that, you know, that, that path, you know, um, obviously I, I saw it as being successful in, you know, and just, um, being very enriching for, you know, for your soul and happiness and being able to be out there in the world and connecting with people that are a similar path, but I didn't realize that it could actually have, um, professional potential that, you know, you might actually be able to end up in a place of financial security with yeah. like, you know, with, with a job, you know, at the end of all of that, you know, I was like, this is, 
wholly irresponsible and you know and i'm i'm just gonna go for it and just to you know to see that it can result in um you know in this some of the same places that the more traditional institutional path might might lead to as well so yeah kind of cool totally i mean that's i kind of have a not a similar experience but like kind of so when i was in um I so I grew up here in Washington DC and there's Great Falls which is you know a kayaking mecca and so pros were always coming through and eventually um Steve Fisher was working on a project here and I was really into photography so I was like on on the river every weekend shooting and ended up getting in contact with him and he um kind of took me under his wing and I, I interned for him like all through high school and he was like pulling me on like little expeditions and like doing projects with him um so you know he he really acted as a mentor for me but he like completely opened my eyes to this whole new world of like the, i mean it's hard to explain because i was in high school i was so young that like being on film sets and like you know going into the back country with kayaks and um you know the, all these kind of experiences were so influential to me and had such an impact that you know I went to, on to graduate college I mean graduate high school and did a little bit of college but ultimately I kind of felt like I was I'd learned so much from those types of experiences that that like super traditional route wasn't quite for me um and you know I was on not on the kayaking side I was on the filming side so you know it, it was easier I, I would say to turn it into a real job but he kind of showed me that that non-traditional route is uh, as possible for sure yeah. and yeah and for the and for the listeners steve St- steve fisher is um a, a really really influential kayaker in the sport he was from the generation before before my generation of, of kayaking and so he was one of the people that i as well kind of drew inspiration from he was sort of you know breaking trail in a lot of ways and how you can actually make it work as a professional kayaker and you know and he had to hustle so hard and, you know, and really, you know, really put his heart and soul into, into professional kayaking, um, innovating boat designs, um, doing a lot of filmmaking, um, you know, his athleticism was really progressive. He led, or he would, he didn't lead, but he was a part of the Sang Po expedition, one of the, uh, you know, um, original huge expeditions that happened in kayaking, um, in Tibet. And he, um, and I was really fortunate to, um, you know, I, you know, my, my kayaking career and, you know, we can, I'm sure Timmy will want to ask questions about all of this, but, you know, my kayaking career went, um, you know, went in the way of basically I, um, started running big waterfalls and went up to Northwestern territories in Canada. I broke the world record on Alexandria falls on the Hay river in the Northwest territories at 107 feet. A couple of years later, I ran Palouse, um, 189 feet tall, broke my own world record there. That's the world record that still stands. And then, um, like two years later, I was running a hundred foot waterfall in Oregon, Abiqua broke my back, like absolutely shattered my vertebrae, um, landed flat, just kind of messed, messed up the line, um, probably shouldn't have been running in the first place. There wasn't a ton of water in the river and um, had to get, you know, a, my vertebrae reconstructed. I had like four bolts and two rods and um, the neurosurgeon used bone marrow for my hip and, and rebuilt my vertebrae. It was, um, you know, and he told me through the process of all of this, he was like, you know, listen, I see this, this injury, in this injury, the same mechanism of injury that you have quite often, um, happens quite a bit in car crashes, uh, you know, 90, 95% of the people with your same injury are, are paralyzed. They, you know, they, they never walk again. You're, you're super lucky, um, not to be paralyzed. I was in this clamshell back brace, uh, sort of recuperating, um, and, and, uh, you know, and Steve Fisher gave me a call and he was like, Hey man, I, have this idea to go and run the highest volume rapids in the world on the Congo river. They're called the Inga rapids. And I would like you to be a part of the team. And I was like, Steve, man, I don't know if you heard, but you know, a couple of weeks ago, I, I broke my back really badly, you know, like all, you know, be maybe able to take my first strokes in a kayak 
in, in, you know, a few months and, you know, the timeline that you're talking about, you know, I might have like a couple of months, you know, of, of paddling to try to get in shape again, you know? And he was like, well, you know, there's a spot for you if you want it. You know, it's obviously in a dangerous place in the world. These rapids are incredibly dangerous. And I just, just like, I was like, man, I, I can't turn this down to go and stand next to some of the most powerful river, you know, powerful whitewater on the planet. Um, you know, Steve Fisher, you know, was, was a bit of a, you know, a role model, a mentor of mine. Um, I was just like, all right, man, I signed up for the trip, tried to do what I could to get strong. And yeah, we ran, um, eight months after I broke my back, I ran the highest volume rapids on the planet. Some of the scariest kayaking I've ever done with my spine fused together, you know, and it was, you know, it, it was just one of the outrageous, most outrageous um, expeditions, experiences of my life. Uh, definitely on the loose side. I wasn't, didn't have my strength fully back. Um, I could still kayak really well. It was much harder to roll the kayak with my spine fused together, but uh yeah, it was, it was incredible. And that, um, and so, yeah, so that's the, that's the time that I've gotten to share in my life uh, most intimately with, with Steve Fisher. And it was an amazing experience. That's a funny story. I'd never heard that before. Um, well, I, kind of, I want to come back to the Inga project, but you know, this is kind of a, an interesting segment. Cause I wanted to ask you about um, obviously breaking your back and what that was like, but one of the things I was curious about was how you kind of stay stayed motivated. Cause when you have a, such a severe injury, like obviously, obviously physically that's painful and, and stressful and everything, but the mental side of it as well, like staying motivated to get back in a kayak. Um, well, it seems like you actually had some motivation here from Steve to get, get ready for the, for a Congo. But, um, you know, what was it like dealing with that? But was it, you know, was it a pretty dark time or, you know, were you able to kind of stay positive through it? Yeah, you know, I've, I've always been able to maintain a, a fairly positive um, outlook in my life. And yeah, I've had to deal with with a, a lot, of, you know, a lot of injuries. And, you know, for for me, it's an opportunity for growth, it's an opportunity to, to dig deep, actually find, you know, that that positive mindset, I, um, you know, I, I actually, you know, as, as gnarly as it is, it's like, you know, I can, I feel like, you know, I can rise to that challenge pretty well and just, you know, and just sort of, you know, sort of like get through it, write it out, give your body, you know, what it needs, like take the time, you know, to like rest, recuperate. Um, and I, you know, although all of those experiences are, you know, kind of heavy and, you know, and, and can be, you know, can be pretty, you know, dark. Um, it's, you know, it's, um, you know, it's, it's important just to like, you know, keep, keep moving. My dad has this great saying, he's like, he's like, when, when you're going through hell, don't stop, you know, like keep going, you know, it'll, it, it, it gets better. And, and it really does, you know, so um, there's some absolute angels out there in the, in the medical world. Um, you know, I've definitely came across some of them in that, in, in that back break. Um, it's just, it's, it's amazing the, the level of care that's out there. And, you know, and I'm, I'm, you know, really fortunate to have had access to that, to, have, you know, broken my, you know, back and have, you know, my the gnarly medical things that have happened in my life happened, you know, in the United States where, you know, there's, there's a high level of care and I had the insurance to be able to afford it, you know, not, not everybody has that, but um, for, for me, um, those experiences could have been way worse. And I think just always, you know, just understanding, you know, like, man like you know like the the kid right next door to me in in the hospital was um you know somebody that was my age in a car accident paralyzed from the armpits down you know and it's just like it's like man like you know you just like you're, you're just grateful in those times that it wasn't any worse as well and just having that perspective i think helps helps you you stay positive and yeah no matter what it is it can always be worse so um yeah it's just just nice to keep that perspective and um, yeah, just use it as a, uh, as an opportunity of growth, as a challenge to, to rise to. And um, yeah, it's, it's amazing what you can do if you, you have to can put yourself in that frame of mind. Yeah. I mean, you clearly, you clearly did it. I mean, you, you managed to get to the Congo. So, I mean, that's, that's pretty impressive judging by that timeline. You know, how, when, how long was it between actually like the accident versus like getting on a plane to, 
the Congo. It was eight months from the from the time that I have. <laughs> That's crazy. Been getting on a plane to the Congo, <laughs> and so you know, and yeah, and and three of those months is like immobile. You know, like you're in a clamshell back brace. You know, and then you know, and then one of those months you're just like trying to like get some mobility back, and then you know, and then you have you know a little bit of time to like actually try to build strength, but it's amazing what, what you'll lose in, you know, three or four months of, of, you know, not being active. Like it's, it's amazing yeah. that it takes so long, you know, you train so hard to be in good shape and you can lose it in not that much time. You know, it's in a lot less time than three months, you know, you can see, you know, years and years of work, you know, just disappear. And so, um, yeah, it's, um, it, it definitely takes, you know, like rebuilding and um, having, yeah, man, having that mental fortitude. But I think, you know, any, any athletes, um, you know, can appreciate, you know, the suffering that happens, you know, that you have to go through to be able to achieve high levels of athleticism and, and really, you know, your, your ability to, to suffer has a lot to do with your ability to be a good athlete, you know, like we're, you know, you're right on the edge of, you know, your, your physical and mental thresholds a lot of times. And so always, you know, always pushing that bar is, um, you know, is, is, how, is how you grow, it's how you become a better athlete, how you become a stronger athlete. And, and injuries are, you know, honestly, um, an opportunity to continue to push that bar and to, you know, to be able to, you know, suffer well and get through it and, you know, hopefully end up with, uh, you know, greater mental capacity on the other side of it. Yeah. 100%. That's a great mindset to have with injuries. Cause it, it is hard sometimes, you know, especially those first couple of days when you're just like, Oh, like everything's different now. <laughs> um, Cool. So let's, uh, let's talk about the Inga project a little bit. Um, you know, I know that that trip was pretty crazy. Like, obviously you have like world's biggest rapids and then you throw in the fact that you're in the Congo and you're dealing with governments and crocodiles and whatever else there was. Um, how was that like in terms of kayaking, was that some of the scariest you've ever done or was that, you know, what, what was that like for you? Yeah, it was, um, the, the rivers, um, 1.6 million CFS, um, you know, it's a huge, huge river. Um, it's hard to, it's the highest volume river on the planet. You know, I mean, that's, it's like an incredible, incredible amount of water moving through there. The, the rapids are really, really chaotic, really unpredictable. Um, when you have that much volume in a river, the water isn't just having a, a direct reaction to the, riverbed beneath it it's like you know it's like currents upon currents you know it's like one piece of water pushing another pushing another and you end up with just like boils and whirlpools in the middle of rapids you end up with waves that um are completely chaotic no no timing no rhythm to the surge of it you know they'll you know they'll break they'll green out they'll um you know turn into holes just you know you know completely randomly and so um, it's really scary kayaking because it's, it's, it's not predictable. It's not like kayaking that, that we're used to where you can actually, um, have a high level of precision just because the, the, you, the rivers and the features within the rivers are consistent. If you don't have that consistency, then, um, you, you, you can't predict things. And so the, um, the, so the river is really scary in that regard. It's also just a really, really big really, really powerful and to make moves, to get places, to try to, you know, run lines. And it is um, incredibly difficult. You just have a ton, you know, just so, so much water um, pushing in all different directions out there. Um, you know, there's like, there's whirlpools that are like literally like the size of football fields, you know, that are sucking in and just pulling in and just like these vortexes in the river that you know, right on top of like, you know, heavy, heavy rapids. And, you know, and so we had, I was in charge of safety on the river. We, you know, used some, you know, pretty innovative, innovative stuff to, to do it. The same mechanism that I used um, for breaking the world record waterfall clamps, your spray skirt on the kayak. The spray skirt is what goes around the cockpit rim of the kayak. It keeps the water out. 
of the kayak. If your kayak fills with water, like you're, you're toast. There's no way it has, you know, it has gone from a kayak to a submarine at that point and you need to get out of it. And so, you know, making sure that the kind that water doesn't enter the kayak is really important. So this device clamps the spray skirt onto the kayak. So, you know, so water can't get in, but you also can't get out. You know, it was full commitment to make this thing fit better. I actually cut the grab loop off of my spray skirt, which is the, you know, the eject cord. It's like, I'm not having fun anymore. I'm out of here. Um, you know, that's when you like swim, that's sort of our plan B in kayaking always. It's actually more like plan C or D plan B is just to deal with whatever goes wrong. Stay in your kayak. Your last resort is to leave your kayak and start swimming. Um, and you can do this if you're stuck. If you're just stuck somewhere in the river, if you're, you know, stuck under a rock, if you're stuck in a hydraulic, if you're stuck on a log, whatever it is, you know, you can generally pull your spray skirt and have a second shot at swimming shore. Congo, that's not an option. You just don't have the, you know, the buoyancy to be able to deal with it or, you know, being able to swim. Um, so we had that, we had a little bit of spare air, some oxygen, you know, in our life jackets, we beefed up our life jackets with, you know, with more foam. Um, we had a secondary inflatable CO2 cartridge activated, um, life jacket, you know, that, that we had around our waist, should we end up getting ripped out of our kayaks? We had leashes on our paddle that basically tied our hands to our paddle so they can get blown away. We had um, hand paddles zip tied to the front of our kayak. So in the event that the, that the paddle did get lost, you could slip into these hand paddles, you know, and, and be able to, you know, theoretically roll up again. Um, and so it, you know, so it was, you know, it was just on another level from anything that any of us had done before. We um, luckily, you know, Steve had it. It was all Red Bull funded. It was, you know, a really expensive trip to pull off, but we had, you know, this badass helicopter, um, really incredible pilot. Um, you know, the, our logistics coordinator, Pete Meredith is just one of, um, the absolute badasses of, um, you know, of river expeditions of our time. Um, he's, he's amazing. He was roped into the helicopter, ready to repel out of the helicopter at any time and try to pluck us out of the river. If we need to, we were wearing, uh, climbing harnesses with, um, carabiners that came up through our life jackets so that, you know, so that we could, you know, theoretically clip the rope. He could get to us. We could clip, clip the rope and get extracted if we needed to. Um, but yeah, it was, it was a really involved, super full on mission, um, flying into Kinshasa in the Congo, you know, one of, um, you know, one of Africa's just most wild cities, city of 8 million people, um, you know, lots of, lots of poverty, lots of really, really hard living going down out there. Um, and, you know, and it's just, you know, it's a difficult to, place to navigate, you know, you're dealing with, um, you know, African politics, um, logistics, um, you know, just all of, you know, some of the difficulties of navigating Africa, um, you know, made that trip really challenging. Also, lots of really beautiful things because of that setting. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's a hard place out there, you know, and um, it's got a lot of hard history. Um, definitely, you know, just with the, um, um, you know, the colonialism that has happened there, um, you know, with King Leopold and Belgium and just the slavery and what those rapids meant, you know, as far as navigation and just the, the systems that were used to get around that section of river and opening up trade routes and, um, you know, ex, you know, exploiting that area for, for rubber. I mean, it is just, it's some of the things that that part of the world have gone through. The people that live there is just, it's, it's heavy. It's really, really difficult. And, um, you know, and it's, uh, it's important history to recognize, but, um, you know, you, you can tell that there's just, you know, there's a lot of trauma. There's a lot of ancestral trauma. It's, um, it's, um, you know, it's, it's a, a gnarly place to go, you know, it's, um, and so, yeah, I mean, that, that, that trip was full on in all regards. Yeah. I mean, one thing that I'm curious about, and you know, this obviously is a part of the Congo, but for any trip and expedition you're on, you know, there's a certain level of fear or, you know, risk taking that you're taking that you're, yeah, that you're taking. Um, 
how do you kind of overcome that? What's your process for dealing with, with things that you're terrified of, you know? Well, um, you know, I think that, uh, you know, fear, fear is, um, is, is always present in, in what we're doing. And ultimately it's a survival mechanism that keeps it safe. It allows, um, you know, it's, it's intuition and, and recognizing, you know, what it is, is really, really important, you know, because, you know, fear is ultimately a tool that, that, that you have to use to keep yourself safe. Um, the absence of fear is, is really unhealthy and, gets you into some, you know, some dangerous places. And when you're, you know, paddling or doing anything at that level, um, you, you can end up dead very quickly. If you, if you ignore your intuitions, um, differentiating between rational fear and irrational fear is, is really important, you know, knowing what fear is holding you back, um, and what fear is actually helping you make good decisions is, is, you know, is important to, um, to be able to do that. I think that, um, you know, so, so many things, um, so many goals, dreams, um, athletic feats, you know, they, you, you do have to pass through this barrier of fear to be able to get there. Um, but when you're in this gray area and if you read it wrong, um, and you decide to push through that fear and do something that, you know, that you maybe not maybe it's a better idea not to do, you know, you can, you can end up, you know, you, you can end up, you know, you know, really hurt or really dead, you know? Um, and, you know, and, and, and I've done that, you know, I've done things that I shouldn't have done, you know, because of this ability for me to sort of be able to take that emotion, um, and, you know, not let it consume me, be able to move through that. Um, you know, I've made, some of the worst decisions of my life, um, by ignoring fear, you know? And so it's, you know, you, you have to, you know, as you create your ability to be able to, um, you know, move, move through fear, you know, you also, you know, need to take responsibility for your, you know, to, you know, for your, yeah, your your disability to be able to do that. So, um, yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's just this line that, you know, all extreme athletes walk, you know, all, you know, all people, you know, walk and, you know, in every day, you know, I think that the benefit of, you know, being an extreme athlete and having to have dealt with fear so much in life is that, you know, you don't, you, you, you don't allow it to, you know, like really, really hold you back. You know, you're able to manage low levels of fear really, really well. Um, and then as well as life goes on, as your body changes, as your brain changes, uh, your, your tolerance of risk and fear, you know, they, they, they start to go down over time. This isn't true for everybody, but it's true for the majority of people where, you know, you, you have this amazing ability to be able to, to deal with, to deal with fear, um, on a pretty high level, you know, when you're, when you're younger, you know, when you're, you know, basically up until the point where you're, you know, in your mid to late twenties, um, it seems like, you know, I was, I was able to, um, process fear, um, a lot differently than I do now. Um, you know, it's also because, you know, I've, I've like, you know, seen the limitations of my body as well, you know, having just, you know, had a lot more experiences of, you know, things not going well. Um, yeah, you, you sort of start to, you know, take a second assessment of, you know, of fear and of your judgment of a situation and what you're comfortable with doing. And, you know, ultimately, um, weighing the, the, the pros and cons of taking that risk, you know, because you usually you stand to lose a lot more than you stand to gain. I'm at the point in my career where I don't have anything to prove, um, you know, to myself or anybody else and, you know, taking high levels of risk, getting hurt really badly, not being able to paddle, um, you know, obviously dying, you know, it's just, you know, you, you really, really, um, I'm, I'm just, you know, in sort of balancing those pros and cons a lot differently than I used to before. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Definitely. I mean, yeah, I think it's going to be hard to convince 
anyone to go off a a hundred foot, 200 foot waterfall (laughs) at this stage in life. Um, what's, uh, you know, looking back on your like major trips and adventures, is there one that really stands out to you for, you know, any reason? Is there one that was more meaningful than the rest? Yeah. You know, some of my, some of my early trips, um, you know, were, were really, really meaningful. Um, you you know, it's, it's interesting. It, you know, so, so much of, um, you know, a meaningful trip is, um, the, the people that surround that trip. Um, you know, one of my, one of my first, um, trips that was really meaningful to me was that trip to Norway and Iceland when I was 15 years old, I went with my father, you know, I was with this, uh, amazing crew of paddlers that were, you know, older than I were, they were, you know, already, you know, they're, they're professional kayakers, the best in the world at the time. And, you know, for, for me, that was a dream trip trip. It was, you know, realizing my dreams of, you know, becoming a professional kayaker of, you know, seeing, of being able to go and do that filming, you know, being with my dad and, uh, you know, that, that trip was, um, absolutely spectacular. You know, the trip that I took, um, you know, to, to Africa on my own when I was graduating from high school is a really, really meaningful trip. Um, lots of lifelong friendships, you know, stem from that trip. And then, you know, and then really I did a series of just like longer trips and they were all very meaningful in their own way. Um, I, we did a trip called the Africa, Africa revolutions tour. Um, I, you know, I bought, um, I bought this Toyota van in Uganda and drove it, um, you know, down to South Africa with a couple of buddies, met up with a a big crew of friends. And, you know, we toured South Africa, you know, Lesotho, uh, went up into Swaziland, Mozambique, um, over to Madagascar, and then up through, you know, Botswana, Zambia, uh, Tanzania, Kenya, back to Uganda and it, you know, and that was a really, really meaningful trip. Did that when I was young, the trip that I did just before that, I converted a Japanese fire truck to run on vegetable oil, drove it from Alaska to Argentina. That was a really, really special trip. Um, and then, um, let's see. And then most recently I, uh, put together, um, uh, in, expedition to circumnavigate the world in a sailboat. Um, it was, you know, an adventure sport expedition and, uh, spent, you know, four years, the trip was four years in total, you know, five or six by the time you add on all, you know, the planning and, um, the preparations, but circumnavigated the world in a sailboat. Um, and that was, you know, that was a spectacular, very, very meaningful trip as well. So yeah, you know, there's been, um, there, I've been really fortunate to be able to, you know, put together some of these, you know, bigger expeditions. It's how, it's ultimately how I cracked the code of, you know, being able to do live the life I wanted to live, but not, you know, fall into this, um, you know, it, like self promotion was, you know, was always really difficult for me. And so, you know, I choose chose to create projects and promote those projects as opposed to, you know, promoting myself. Um, you know, getting sponsorship dollars for those projects. And then, um, you know, and then, you know, basically, you know, living my life from one, you know, big expedition to the next, you know, allowed me to sort of, you know, get around this whole thing of, you know, like, hey, you know, like, you know, you should pay me to represent your brand. I'm cool. I do cool things. It was more like, hey, I have this project that I feel is meaningful these are the details of it. Um, we're looking for support for this. Um, and, you know, and then obviously, you know, doing all like the photography and filmmaking that it takes to create those deliverables. I also feel really lucky that, um, the majority of my professional career happened before social media. And so, you know, so it was great, you know, we weren't like, you know, out there, you know, we weren't wearing GoPros, we weren't doing social media posts. Um, you know, we were, you know, we were creating, you know, we were creating films, we were doing, you know, high level photography, um, writing, you know, articles for magazines, and had to take more of like the traditional media approach, which, you know, which I think was, was, was really amazing. Um, 
I feel like technology is, you know, consuming so much of our lives these days. I'm, I'm certainly no exception to that. You know, like I spend more time on my phone than I'd like to, but um, yeah, you know, I think just like getting out of that whole, um, you know, I'm cool, you know, look at me, you know, look at all the people that like to follow me sort of, you know, mentality of, of where athleticism is now, um, was, was really a blessing and I'm stoked, you know, it was amazing, you know, like these, these days, you know, to be a professional athlete, you know, to, to get the jobs that, you know, or the sponsors, you know, that are actually paying money, you know, it's like, you've had to dedicate so much time to, you know, building social media followings, um, that, you know, it's just, you know, it, it just sucks. And it just feels, you know, it feels a little bit disingenuous to, you know, the realities that, that we're actually living. And, you know, and there's this whole can of worms and I know everybody's feeling it and starting to see sort of the dark side of, you know, of, you know, of social media and dedicating so much of our lives and our energy and attention to these, you know, tech companies that are investing billions of dollars into, you know, making, apps incredibly addictive for us and spending more time on our phone and our attention really becoming the product, you know, of, of this whole economy, you know, and it's, um, it's, you know, it's scary to see what's happening and, um, to see the world that kids and young athletes are entering into. Um, you know, I and myself haven't quite figured out how to navigate all that yet. Um, so I know that as a young person, um, I'm sure, I'm sure that's challenging, um, then there's also, also opportunities, you know, that come along with it. You know, you don't have to be, you know, the best athlete on the planet being in, you know, getting in magazines. You don't have to be, you know, on the cover of Sports Illustrated. You don't have to be in, you know, the latest, you know, Netflix feature film, you know, slam dunk to, um, you know, to be able to um, create a livelihood for yourself. Um you know, doing, doing what you love, you know, everybody is sort of their own self-publicized, you know, person at this point. Um, so yeah, so there is, there is, um, you know, benefit that comes along with it too. And I think that it's just, you know, a matter of, you know, finding the balance there. Yeah. It's a whole new world. It's, it's kind of crazy to think about what it takes to be a pro athlete these days. Like you have to have obviously the physical athletic side, and then you also have to be a media personality and be blowing yourself up all the time and trying to get as much, uh, attention as, I mean, you don't necessarily have to, but if you want to be, you know, well, a lot of sponsors, you know, you have these crazy media obligations. Um, it is, yeah, it's a really different world. It's, I think I never lived that life, so I don't really know, but as a spectator to it, it, um, it seems really tough right now, particularly after like watching the Olympics and seeing, you know, these young kids there and, you know, you go on to their, they're like 16, 17, 18, whatever they are. And they go and they have 5 million Instagram followers. It's like the pressure of that many people watching you is something else. I mean, I, that sounds tough. (laughs) It's a, it's a very interesting new world to navigate. And, um, you know, and, it, and it's also really amazing. You know, I look at the coming generation of athletes and it's super, super inspiring. I think that, you know, from from where I was, you know, as as a kid, you know, in that like glued together, like neoprene vest and a homemade gear and a kayak that was, you know, four sizes too big for me, you know, and now I watch kids getting into the sport where, you know, they have like, you know, the best gear, the, you know, everything sized for them. They have access to like, you know, all of this information, like, you know, that what the perceived limitations are for, for kids these days is so much less than for us because, you know, they're, you know, they're, they're watching, you know, the Olympic, you know, skiers and the half pipe, you know, just doing like, the latest, you know, gnarliest, most amazing thing. They're able to like, you know, watch it over and over again on YouTube, you know, start replicating that, you know, our ability to just, you know, access information is, is amazing. And our ability to access gear is really amazing. And I'm seeing um, some really, really high level, um, very, very inspiring athletes coming out of the coming generation. And, you know, and, and a part of that for sure is just, 
amazing athleticism. And a part of that is just like this epic timing of coming into sports where, you know, the gear is so good and the, you know, and our access to information is so available. And so um, I think that it's also, you know, an incredible time to be getting into sports, you know, like I love it, you know, like I've, you know, recently been, you know, getting into paragliding and the gear is just incredible, you know, and you're talking to these old timers that are in the sport, you know, and they're just like, yeah, man, like it's, you know, paragliders used to, you know, like have a two to one glide going straight to the ground, you know, and, and now, you know, you're like, the glide is amazing. The safety is so, is so much on a higher level, you know, and it's just like, like there is like no better time in history to, you know, start practicing sports than right now, you know, like, the, the equipment learn is so much incredible yeah. you can learn so much and you know and, and and like i say you know like yeah like you know using you know being able to use you know not only you know resources of of people but also you know online resources to learn you can learn just about anything these days you know and so um i think that it just you know it just takes you know focus um it, it takes, you know, just, a, you know, a lot of, um, you know, you know, dedication to, you know, to being able to just like decipher, you know, what you want to do, which information you want to pay attention to, um, and, you know, use, you know, have a high level of discipline to be able to sort of navigate, you know, like wade through this like wild world of information that we have available to us and sort of um, condense it down into, you know, the pertinent points, the important things that, um, you know, that, that you want to take away from it, you know, like you really have to use it. Don't let it use you. Um, and man, and, but, you know, other than that is beautiful, you know, there's a lot that hasn't changed in sports, you know, I mean, there's still like this amazing camaraderie. There's amazing communities of people out there, you know, there's like so much, you know, support out there for people that are, that are getting into it, that, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's really, you know, it's inspiring. And so, um, well, a lot's changing, you know, there's also aspects that haven't changed. And I think that, you know, um, you know, a lot of that is for the best, I feel like. Yeah, totally. Um, well, I think this kind of brings us to a good place to kind of round it out. I mean, I, I just wanted to see, you know, where are you today? And, um, what are your priorities? You know, I, I assume life's a little bit different now. COVID changed things for everyone. You know, where, what's going on? Yeah. You know, um, I have the benefit of spending five years on a sailboat going around the world very, very slowly. My boat was not fast and, uh, <laughs> got a lot of time disconnected out there in the open ocean, you know, just to, um, you know, be lonely, think about things that, you know, were really, really important to me. And my big takeaways from sailing, um, you know, were that the things that are important to me are, you know, friends and family, mountains and rivers. And you know, so I've been spending, you know, spending as much time as I can, um, you know, just back out on the river with my friends um, back in Montana with, you know, with my family and, um, you know, time just, you know, connecting to nature. Um, I think that we all, you know, over this last couple of years, you know, spent a lot of time just being able to, um, you know, spend time, you know, away from people out in nature. I think that that is, um, incredibly beneficial. I think that it's amazing for, for your mind, for your health. Um, just, yeah, just to be outside, um, appreciating the world. Um, it's been great. I've been, working locally, um, supporting some local conservation efforts here, um, you know, doing some conservation film work. Uh, you know, I live in White Salmon, Washington. I get to paddle really high level whitewater almost every day. Um, I've been focusing a lot more on, you know, on training, on cross training, spending time in the gym, being healthy and, um, yeah. And always in the back of my mind, sort of thinking about what, what the next big adventure might be. Nice. Any, uh, anything we should be watching out for? Um, yeah, we have a, we have a series coming out about that, uh, the sailing expedition that I, that I just completed. It's, um, it's a nine episode series. We're shopping distribution for it right now. So, um, 
yeah um just yeah stay stay tuned we'll have that um we'll have that coming out at some point i'm sure that timmy can share some links on where to find me out there in the digital world and uh we should have a really exciting announcement coming here in the next few weeks awesome yeah we will uh, definitely circulate that when it, when the time comes um i think that uh that about wraps it up thank you so much tyler yeah timmy thank you so much appreciate chatting Thanks for listening to this episode of Adventurous Minds. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you want to stay up to date with the latest releases, you can scan the QR code or find us on Instagram at Adventurous Minds Pod. See you out there.